Hi everyone. First, thanks to the organizer of the conference for inviting me as a speaker. I'm really sad that I can't be with you in Nagasaki, but in the spirit of the times, at least I can do this remote presentation. The talk is called From Nakamoto to Yoso, a new model for multi-party computation, and it's based on a series of papers that I've had with um, various co-authors, which are all listed at the bottom. So let's start at the beginning. First of all, what is multi-party computations? This is a primitive that's been around for a long time. We have n parties, p1 up to pn, and each one has a private input, x1 up to xn, pi holds xi, and they want to compute a function of these inputs, f of x1 up to xn. This, of course, can be trivially achieved by every person publishing their xi, but we want to make things harder and more interesting, so we add the requirement that we want to preserve the privacy of the inputs of the parties. Though I had said that the issue of privacy, of preserving the privacy of the inputs, was introduced in order to make the problem more interesting, this could have been initially the motivation when the problems were asked at the beginning. But over time, these technologies of multi-party computations have turned out to be something that we desperately need due to privacy um, regulation, things such as GDPR and HIPAA and more and more all over the world require that privacy of data of parties maintain, be maintained and uh, provided to the people. However, we do want to utilize the data. For example, medical data, we do want to compute over the medical data and reap the rewards that we get from including more data in the computation. So these techniques really are the ones that enable privacy preserving um, applications. So though maybe it started as a uh, intellectual curiosity, it has definitely evolved into something that we um, need. This problem has had a long history with results starting in the 80s, which were feasibility results that had shown that we can in fact compute um, functions with such privacy in the computational model, in the information theoretic model, with various bounds and so on. And over the years, there have been many, many results um, dealing with different adversaries, malicious, semi-honest, mobile, again, uh, computational or information theoretic setting. And there have been an endless number of actually very beautiful, beautiful results. But now we've come to a new era. We want to consider a mega MPC setting when there are many, many, many parties. So what is many, many parties? We'll assume that N, N is capital N is the number of parties participating in the computation, is in the millions. That's really huge when we think about things before. We think about three, four, if we were ambitious, 10, 15, but here we're talking really about millions of parties. But this mega MPC also presents a mega problem. Most of the solutions that we have for multi-party computations, their complexity is quadratic in the number of parties. At best, there are solutions that are even more than quadratic. But even quadratic already creates a problem and in fact makes the multi-party computation unrealistic in this mega setting because if you're thinking about a million parties, n square is already too much in order um, to do both computation and communication. So do we have an idea of how maybe we can overcome this problem of having so many parties but still deliver a multi-party computation? So a natural idea is to take a small subset of the parties, 
that will constitute some committee that will run the computation on behalf of all the parties. We'll take an N which is much, much smaller than um, capital N. Let's say in the order of a thousand parties, 500 parties. So this is our universe. The big ball is the capital N. And we are looking at that small committee, that white ball, um, which will carry out the computation on behalf of the um, universe. So this is what we're imagining. But now we have to discuss the adversary. What is our model of attack on this system? And most times we allow the adversary to corrupt a fraction of the parties, say a quarter. Here, I've marked the quarter that the adversary can corrupt. But this creates another problem. I very conveniently for me put the quarter and the upper uh, left side of this universe and my committee is on the right quarter. But in fact, nobody guarantees that this is the situation. And in fact, if the adversary is aware of what the committee is, who are the parties who are doing the computation on behalf of everyone, the adversary can in fact corrupt the full committee and we cannot have a computation um, that is remains private because the adversary in fact will learn the inputs of all the parties. So we have to find a way around it because really going back to the computation of everyone is unachievable. So what can we do? Maybe we create a situation where the adversary does not know who's on the committee. But how can we do this? How can we deliver this thing? So what do we want? What do we envision? We want something like this. Again, this is our universe. And this party, now it looks like the size of the committee, but a party says, I'm in the committee, but I'm done doing my job. So we want sort of a situation that parties can compute, announce that they've done the work, and disappear. And then another party pops up and says, I'm on the committee, but I'm also done doing my job. So the question is, can we deliver such a thing? And the idea would be that every party would self-nominate themselves into the computation. I'll say, I'm on the committee because I decided that. And here is my work that I'm doing. And then... I will disappear. Now, if we could actually have this self-nominating property, then it would immediately imply, immediately imply that the attacker does not know who is on the committee. But maybe the attacker corrupts a subset of parties and now tells those parties, self-nominate yourself to the committee. Of course, that wouldn't work again. So we need to find a way that we have a robust self-nominating process that parties cannot just say, hi, I'm on the committee and compute, but really that there is a way that a person self-nominates and the other people can in fact verify and agree that that person should have been on the committee. We will start with this self-nominating idea later when we go into more involved protocols. Uh, we will need to work a little bit harder um, to do the nomination to the committee. So how do we do this self-nomination? In 2008, Nakamoto came along with a beautiful idea. And he said, to self-nominate, you need to solve a puzzle. And once you've solved it, you'll prove that you've solved it. And then you will be a legitimate um, party who needs to be part of the computation. So what is the idea here? There is this puzzle. The puzzle is given out by some process. In Bitcoin, it is some specific process. In other places, it's other processes. And the puzzle is put out there. 
And then everybody can locally sit quietly without telling anyone and try to solve this puzzle. And eventually somebody presents the solution to the puzzle and says, I solved the puzzle. I'm on the committee. So once the person has solved the puzzle, they can show the solution to the puzzle and everyone can in fact verify that they are on the, the person on the committee or a person who needs to carry out an action. And how did Nakamoto suggest that we would have access to a puzzle? He had used ideas from Dwork Naor and from Bach, which is proof of work. And because of this, every party that sees the solution can in fact also verify that the party is the solver of the puzzle. And the attacker can do as well as anyone else. It can try to get its parties on the committee, but it still needs to solve the problem, the hard problem, the puzzle, and it has chances just as everyone else, which means that the attacker cannot get its parties on the committees beyond um, what it could do by solving the puzzle. So what did Nakamoto want to use this puzzle and self-nomination procedure for? He wanted it in order to create the blockchain. What is the functionality that he wanted? It had no interaction because all it was required was that somebody would choose a block and it had no secret inputs either because everything on the blockchain in fact is public. So the process went as follows to satisfy this functionality. You solve the, pro the puzzle, you announce your solution to the puzzle, this makes you the leader, and then you announce what the next block is. And this was the full functionality that Nakamoto wanted to achieve with this self-nominating procedure that was designed via the puzzle solving. But this is not all the protocols that we have. What about protocols that require communication? We do want to solve a larger um, set of problems uh, in this model where we have a big universe and a small committee that is computing. So the next step in this process was the protocol of Jingov Kali the, which is the underlying consensus protocol for the Algorand blockchain. And they, in fact, implemented a Byzantine agreement protocol. Now, this is a much more complex protocol because it has interaction and multiple rounds. Still no secret inputs, but it's more complex and how do you deliver it in a way that the adversary does not know who the parties are that are participating in the protocol? Because if it has multiple rounds, let's say I solved the puzzle in the first round and I speak, but now I need to participate in the second round of the protocol as well. The attacker already knows who I am and can corrupt me if they so wish. So now we have a bigger challenge. Clearly, this thing cannot work in a straightforward manner. So what do we do? So first of all, we need a better self-nominating uh, procedure. The puzzle solving and the proof of work um, method takes 10 minutes in order to solve the puzzle and to um, avoid as much as possible um, the occurrence of collisions. So this is not good enough if you need to run a protocol that has many rounds. If it's a one round thing, okay, it takes 10 minutes. But if it's a six round protocol, now it suddenly takes an hour, that does not make any sense. So we need a way um, which will be a better and more efficient way to self-nominate. So the way that it is done in Algorand and in other blockchain protocols in different but similar ways is via a verifiable random function. 
This self-nomination takes milliseconds. It's basically a computation of a signature, if you want to think about it as such. And it's really, really fast, and it provides all the properties that the original Nakamoto um, puzzle provided, which means that everybody can verify that once I announce that I'm on the committee, everybody can in fact verify that this is correct. And the adversary cannot nominate its people to the committee just because it wants to. There is a process here which it cannot fake as well. So what did we have in a regular multi-party protocol? There are multiple steps, step one, step two, step three, and all the steps are computed by the same committee. You can see here, it's the same committee that is running every step of the protocol. And if we're in our little committee, then this would be the same set of people if we directly implemented the multi-party computation model. But as we said, you remember that we have a problem that once the committee is known, the attacker can corrupt that whole committee because it has enough parties that it is able to corrupt. Maybe if it's a million, it couldn't corrupt 250,000, and the committee is 1,000, of course, he can get them all. So Jing and Mikali introduced the idea of player replaceability. And what does that mean? The first step starts the same. A committee self-nominates itself to execute the first step. But then when we move to the next step, it's going to be a new committee that executes this step. And the third step will be at another committee and so on and so forth. Every step is going to be computed by a different um, committee. And this will bring us again to the situation that the attacker cannot corrupt the committee because a committee is going to self-nominate, is going to announce what it needs to do, and evaporate. Then the next committee will come in, do the second step, and evaporate, and so on and so forth. And before they execute their step, they are all unknown. So it might be quite surprising that we can achieve a protocol which is as complex as Byzantine agreement under this setting, but it actually works. Every step can be computed and carried out by a different committee, and at the end, we still have a Byzantine agreement which is known to the entire um, universe, to the big end parties. But... What did I say about this protocol? I said that Byzantine Agreement is a protocol that has no secret information. But when we're talking in the multi-party computation setting, our biggest motivation is that each party, PI, holds an input XI and that they compute a function while preserving the privacy of these inputs. Now try to think about it in this multi-party computation setting, if every committee is speaking once, then who's going to hold this secret information? How are we going to transfer secret information from one round to another, from one different committee to another committee? So it seems like there is a huge issue here once we move to the realm where there is secret information. So the question is, can we take it a step further? And Yoso, we can. As I said, Yoso is the end of the talk from Nakamoto to Yoso. So yes, we can. Yoso stands for you only speak once. And what is that next step? As I said before, it's protocols that have interaction which we already achieved in the Byzantine Agreement Protocol with multiple rounds, but they also have secret information. So 
What did we prove in the Yoso model? Which I said, again, you only speak once. And once I've said it, Yoso, 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 if you'll never forget this model. And hopefully you will also adopt it and work in it and deliver new uh, results because there's room for a lot of work here. So what did we prove in our um, Yoso paper? Our main theorem says exactly like the feasibility solutions that we had in the 80s for multi-party computations, we show again that we can compute any function in the Yoso model. And our Yoso paper provides two solutions, a computational one and an information theoretic one. I want to add that although I didn't present it this way in the talk, I sort of built up. First, I presented Nakamoto in the Bitcoin protocol and the puzzle solving. And then I introduced Jing and Mikali, which did something more and managed to solve Byzantine agreement. And only now I'm introducing Yoso, but I want to make it clear that those protocols also are a Yoso protocol, that these ideas sort of stem from there, that you only speak once. Starting from Nakamoto through Jing Mikali and to the final formulation of our paper, which gives the full feasibility um, result. Now, I've sort of hinted to you that it's hard to design in the Yoso model because first of all, MPC protocols are very interactive and you need to speak much more than once. If it's based on a circuit calculation, there's zero knowledge proofs, many, many things that go into a design of a multi-party computation and these involve multiple, multiple rounds. And as I also said the servers hold secret information, which we want to maintain as secret information because that's the requirement that the function would only reveal the output and preserve the privacy of the inputs. So let's start slowly and start to define the Yoso world and what it means for a protocol to be Yoso. So first of all, when we executed multi-party computations, we had abstract roles, P1, P2, up to Pn, and we always would say Pi does this, P5 does this, and so on and so forth. But in the Yoso model, we have to break things up because in the original setting, P1 spoke through all rounds, and here, we can't have this situation. So we break the protocol into roles. For example, the role is a shareholder in the VSS of step five, or a party that adds two secrets in step eight, and so on and so forth. There are many, many, many roles. So we need to take the protocol and break it up into these roles. and. These roles need to be such that each role speaks only once, because otherwise we're back to our problem. We anyway might as well run a regular MPC with P1 up to Pn. So if we can succeed in breaking the protocol into these roles that speak only once, then we can hope to deliver a solution in the Yoso model. And these roles send information to the next role, not to a party again, but to the next role. Let's say the shareholder in VSS of step five will send something to a party whose role is um, the one that adds the two secrets in step eight. So all these connections will be fully defined by the design of the protocol. Okay, so we have the roles. But who computes the function? Now, what are the servers that are actually going to be doing the computation? So basically, we have a set, a small set of servers. Let's say we decided that the committee would be a size of 1,000. We need to assign 
a server to each one of these roles, a machine that will actually execute the step during the computation of the function. So we need to provide a mechanism for randomly and secretly assigning a machine to a role. So let's say I own a machine, I will be assigned through some mechanism that role of shareholder in the VSS of step five. So I will be given that, assi that assignment. Once I'm given the assignment, I will execute the step of that shareholder of the VSS, whatever needs to be done. I'll announce it and I will disappear. So we have to enable also message delivery to future roles. Let's say that I'm the machine executing that VSS step in, in round five. And I said that I need to deliver it to the party, that to the role that's going to be adding two secrets in step eight. I need to be able to deliver that message without knowing which machine is going to execute that role in that future step. So what is the main tool that we have for this um, computation? On the left, you have the roles. These are the roles that will be executing some set of steps, I1 up to IN. And what we need to do, and on the left, we have all the machines. You see, it's the big N, it's the machines of the universe. And we need to assign a machine that will execute the role I3 and I5. And all these roles need to be assigned machines that will carry out the computation. When I will be computing my step in step five, let's say that I3 is the party that I need to send the message to in order to execute in step eight and round eight, I will know how to send it to I3, but I will not know who's the party that's connected to it, who will compute it. And that party needs to be able to access that information. So we will have some assignment, some anonymous assignment that will assign the machine P3 to the role I1. And that P3 will compute that step when the time comes and announce the results. So a big part of the work is to be able to construct this anonymous channel. The nice thing about this anonymous channel is that it's a plugin. If you manage to design a better um, anonymous channel, you can take the anonymous channel from our paper, throw it out, plug in your anonymous channel, and you're still working. Because the Yoso is basically a framework that tells you you need to define the roles, then you just need to assign them to parties that will compute. So once this happens, via whichever mechanism you design, you're good to go. These parties, P1, P3, P5, and Pn, will compute their assigned roles, they will announce the results, and they will disappear. Okay. So here, as I said before, when Nakamoto had his self-nominating um, system, it was very easy and a party could self-nominate. But here, things are not that simple. Because here, look, on the port I1, where the information comes in, I, let's say I need to send the message to that future role, I need to encrypt it. So I, there needs to be some key that is associated with that future role. But who's that? P3 is the one who's going to be executing that step. P3 can't announce, I am going to be executing the role I1, here is a public key, all these messages sent to that public key, because then P3 has already spoken and it's over. So we need somehow for someone to announce a key 
for this role, for I1, it cannot be the party that's going to be executing it. And for that party eventually to get, or maybe at this time, to get the secret key in order to decrypt these messages. So there is a very, very subtle point here that in order to be Yoso, we can't do things um, by self-nomination the, the straight way that was done in Nakamoto. So we said that the next committee cannot self-nominate because it needs to announce its public keys in order for people to send messages, encrypted messages to it. So that does not work. So the question is, maybe we allow the current committee to choose the next committee. This seemed, when we were working on it at the beginning, like a natural solution. But once you think about it a little bit more, you see that there is a huge problem. So let's say that we're on the first committee and the attacker, because it didn't know who the committee was, managed to get one little demon on that committee, one party that is corrupted. Now, let's say that this committee nominates the next committee. So this is going to be the next committee. But this little guy can nominate a guy that the attacker has control over. So it already has this one person which was nominated by a faulty party. But then the attacker has more advantage because he also gets some random choices of parties. So now he has two parties in the next committee which are faulty. And if this continues, these two guys nominate two people and then from the random selection, the attacker gets yet another person. And you can see already the problem that eventually the attacker will control the full committee and brings us back to the situation that everything is known to the attacker, which of course does not work. So we need to find a different way for the committees to be nominated and to preserve this in the YOSO setting. So who is going to nominate the committee? We saw in the Nakamoto protocol, in the Bitcoin protocol, and in the Jing Mikali protocol in Algorand, that in the case where parties had no private information and did not need to receive any private messages, that there was no problem, that they could self-nominate, whether it was through the proof of work in the Bitcoin case or via the verifiable random function in the proof of stake um, protocol. But they could self-nominate and that was very, very important. So what we want to do is we want to introduce a new committee a nominating committee. And this is a committee that aside from choosing the parties that are going to be on a computing committee needs to do nothing. There is no interaction in that protocol. There is no private inputs. They have no secret information and so on. So if we have this nominating committee, which self-nominates, this again puts the adversary with no advantage because whoever he gets randomly in that self-nominating process he has on that committee. And that committee nominates the computing committee. So it's true that for every party on the nominating committee, which the attacker has control over, he can control the party in the computing committee and he can get his random choices in the computing committee, whatever luck brings him that his parties were chosen into that computing committee. But the problem is not continuously compounded. It's not now that in the next committee he has more because now he goes back to a new nominating committee over which he has no control of. And as you can see here, again, he has only one party in the nominating committee, which can choose one bad party in the computing committee and his random lucky party that he got. But he cannot 
continuously increase the number of parties on the computing committee. This thing is sort of erased every time a new nominating committee, which self-nominates, um, is introduced. And the attacker can only have the luck of the draw on the nominating committee. So this sort of breaks the uh, compounding process of having bad parties on the committee. So this is um, a protocol which we introduced in our paper, the breaking of the nominating committee and the computing committee. So there are two aspects to having a protocol in the YOSO model, to having something that works with parties only speaking once. What we've discussed so far is the question of how do we assign, assign uh, machines to um, complete the roles which we've defined in the protocol. But now the question is, how do we actually create a protocol which has these roles which speak only once? So in our work so far, what we did was we took existing protocols and we sort of yosified them. We turned them into protocols where there are roles which need to speak only once. I will touch upon in the open questions on options of doing things differently. So the question is, if you give me a protocol, which is in the regular MPC protocol, which requires communications and so on, can we, with specific tools, transform it into a protocol of roles which only speak once. Here the answer is a little bit unsatisfactory. We don't really have tools that they can convert a protocol from a regular protocol into a YOSO appropriate protocol. But we do have some tools. And one of these tools I will be um, discussing now when we move forward, which is the question of how do you take a protocol where a party needs to speak multiple times and enable it, in fact, to do these multiple um, uh, um, speeches, even if it is not present anymore, if the original party is not any uh, this is not there anymore to say what is needed. And this is what we will be discussing now, which is called um, future broadcast. But now we have a huge problem because as we said, protocols are inherently interactive and multi-rounds and a party that speaks in one round, usually the protocol, the, it, the content of the protocol requires it to speak in a future round. So how can we enable a party to speak in the future? We need this. So one of the tools which we introduced is this option for me, if I need to speak in round five, but I also need to speak in a future round, I have this mechanism which is called future broadcast, which in fact enables me to speak once now, whatever I need to do, but also to send my messages into the future and have them be spoken by me at a later time. How is this done? For simplicity, just assume uh, that everybody is semi-honest. And I have a message S, which I need to say in, now we're in round five, this message needs to be spoken in round S. I will break the message S into shares, S1 up to Sn, that sum up to this S, and I will send it to roles in the future. What is these roles? The party one that holds a part of the secret S, the party two that holds a part of the secret S, and so on. I send these to the parties in the future, and in the future, when they need to speak, they will all announce 
in time t now when i'm sending it it's secret everybody holds this value but in time t plus k when it needs to be announced they will make these values public and everybody will be able to learn the value s now i said that you can assume that the parties are semi-honest to show that it works but of course we have techniques where we can do it when we don't need to assume that all the future parties are semi-honest but one thing which is very interesting about speaking into the future we only want and need to provide honest parties the ability to truthfully speak in the future because a faulty party can speak a wrong value now and can also speak a wrong value in the future. So we do not care to provide any guarantees for a faulty party. All we want to ensure is that if I'm an honest party and I'm sending my message in time t to a future time t plus k, that in fact my s is the value that will be reconstructed. And that is very simple to do in one round of me speaking in time t. I can am able to create this value which will be reconstructed properly in time t plus k. There are many applications where the Yoso model can be used, but I want to talk here about one of the most interesting of them and really where it's a game changer. The blockchain, as in a data structure has no privacy. Everything on the blockchain is visible to people. There isn't even anonymity, there's only pseudo-anonymity. But anyways, everything that is put on the blockchain can be seen by everyone. A smart contract cannot hold a secret key because it is yet again visible on the blockchain. So the question is, how do we introduce into the blockchain some ability to sign? on behalf of the blockchain, to be a trusted party, to notarize things, to certify things, if we cannot keep any secret information on the blockchain. Now, our solutions that um, apply the YOSO model enable us to do exactly that. Because you can take secret king material and distribute it over a set of parties. And those parties can sign on behalf of the blockchain. The reason that we need to operate in the YOSO model, of course, is because the number of servers that are signing on behalf of the blockchain is very small and could in fact all be corrupted if known. So we need the YOSO framework in order to eliminate this corruption ability. But once we have protocols as we have designed for sharing secrets, and using them as keying materials and signatures and encryption and so on, we can have, we can transform the blockchain into a trusted party. And this is a huge advantage of designing our protocols, these MPC protocols in the YOSO model. So this is one of the most interesting applications that we have and hopefully with time, these things will be um, adopted by blockchain designs to really enable also this layer above of being able to do things that currently cannot be done because everything is public on the blockchain. Another follow-up work that we had to the YOSO model was to provide threshold as a service. That paper really has two components, and one exactly relates to what I've spoken about before, which is enabling the blockchain to preserve in a secret manner keying material. But because it's in the YOSO model, you need to be able to refresh this distributed um, sharing of the key from round to round, really sort of to proactivize, for those of you who know what that means, to proactivize the sharing of the key from one committee to another committee. And we give specific solutions in this threshold as a service paper. 
the reason that we do not use our generic um, solutions from the Yoso paper is because those are not efficient enough. And in this threshold as a service paper, we actually tried to design things that would run in a reasonable amount of time and also gave implementations to show that this can actually be achieved. This paper threshold as a service also has, but not in the Yoso model, um, uh, efficient multi-key and randomness generation, which are very efficient, but that's of a different type, but of also additional interest. So what would we love? We would love for you to join the Yoso model efforts. There's a lot of work to be done here. Um, just to give a few examples, um, the assignment model, the module that assigns roles to the machines to find better ways and efficient ways to actually deliver these solutions. And as I said, this is plug and play. If you get better ways of doing it that are efficient and so on, with better resilience, then our modules can be simply taken out and the better modules be put in immediately achieving efficient solutions for the whole protocol. Um, so as I had said, when we had designed our um, uh, feasibility results, both for the computational setting and for the information theoretic setting, we basically took existing protocols and transformed them into protocols that we broke up into roles and that work in the Yoso model. But the truth is that probably designing things from scratch with the Yoso model in mind would probably yield better protocols. So this is another interesting direction of research. And then also to find specific special purpose protocols that could utilize the Yoso model that it fits well in the setting of where they um, run that things would be with a speak only type um, communication pattern. So to find those and design protocols for that. So this is it. I want to thank you all for listening and I hope that we do get to meet in person in some upcoming conference soon. Bye.